What I really talk about this afternoon is talking through panic, <coughs> Pat de Murray and the exhaustion unit. <coughs> Pat de Murray was a witness of nearly all the stages of the Northfield experiments. He enlisted in the Royal Army Medical Corps in 1942 and was trained for <coughs> Army Secretary by John Rickman and Wilfred Bion at Northfield Military Hospital. Due to this, he not only witnessed the first Northfield experiment conducted by Rickman and Bion, but also participated in the second Northfield experiment undertaken by Bridger, Fuchs, and Maine, which, which according to Tom was really the third. Regarding this latter experiment, he criticized that no large intergroup, that as no large intergroup meeting per se was established at the time in Northfield, it was left to Fuchs, like a shaman, to act as a link between the different groups involved and thus to represent the large group in his person. As a consequence of this, Damare said Northfield did not directly represent itself as a large group. Fuchs, in his first book, Introduction to Group Analytic Psychotherapy, referred to the cooperation with de Marais several times and thanked him as an old Northfieldian for his contributions, he, for the contributions he made to the book. However, whilst Fuchs remained at Northfield from 1943 right until the end of the war in Europe and in the Far East, de Marais in between left the hospital to run a so-called exhaustion center throughout the European <coughs> campaign most probably first in Italy, and subsequently to the Allied landing in Normandy attached to the sector of Montgomery's 21st Army Group. Only afterwards, he returned to Northfield at the time of the second or the third experiment. By setting up so-called exhaustion centers, the British Army <clears throat> responded to one of the crucial lessons of military psychiatry during the First World War. <coughs> Namely, that, acu that if acutely traumatized soldiers were once removed from, a, from the battle zone for being treated in the hinterland of the front, they usually, did, they usually did not return to there. Confronted with the high rates of psychic casualties among the American expeditionary force in France due to shell shock and traumatic neurosis, one-seventh of the fighters were discharged for disability. The US government in 1917 sent an observatory commission to Europe, led by Thomas Salmon, a general practitioner for, formerly working at Ellis Island. Its task was to collect and to synthesize the British and the French experience and to design an overall program for the prevention and the treatment of the war neurosis. Based on interviews and his personal experience, Salmon formulated four core principles of what was now called forward psychiatry, that is the treating of acutely traumatized soldiers near the battle zone, namely proximity, immediacy, expectancy, and simplicity. Proximity for opening a new space for trustworthiness amid chaos. <coughs> Immediacy for creating a living temporality in contact with urgency. Expectancy for constructing a welcome after the return from hell. And finally, simplicity for emphasizing the obligation to speak without any jargon. According to Françoise Davoine and Max Godelière, two Lacanian psychoanalysts and professors at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in, in Paris, these principles are the four pillars to define the space-time of a new language game for an experience which is not so much unspeakable as inaudible. They conceive the Salmon principles as a rigorous foundation for the dynamics of a transference aimed at the creation of a new social link on the ruins of loyalty and the creation and hence of speech. <coughs>
a link giving rise to a kind of minimal society emerging from the absolute aloneness on the battlefield and thus the only way out of a situation in which men have become things and in which all otherness that is not murderous has been banished from the death zones sometimes for several generations. As noted by Edgar Jones, De Maria was in charge of exhaustion center number 31 field, dress, field dressing station with 100 beds in France and later on in Holland. To meet the challenge of this task, the practicing of the salmon principles must have been equally important as his group experiences at Northfield with Rickman, Beyond Fuchs and others. Taking this into consideration, it is my contention that De Mare's experience of the exhaustion centers should be considered as a relevant and important context for his later group analytic work with larger groups and especially his conceptualization of group dialogue and his conviction that the only <coughs> answer to mass violence is collective dialogue. I suspect that the Salmon Principles provided an inspiration and a starting point for what de Murray many years later described as the, as the passage from hate through dialogue to culture in the large group. Moreover, as Davoine and Gaudelier explain in their book on history beyond trauma, these principles were also closely associated with the beginnings of, psychoanal of the psychoanalysis of the psychosis in the United States. They were not only taught at the Washington School of Psychiatry, for, founded in 1930 by Harry Stack Sullivan, but they also and crucially informed Frieda from Reichman's intensive psychoanalytic work with psychotic patients in Chestnut Lodge. Mentioning this, the contours of a professional network become become visible uh, of a professional network across continents, become visible. Having been the first woman to be granted a university degree in, in German psychiatry from Reichmann, somewhat earlier as S.H. Fuchs, had also been an assistant of Kurt Goldstein and in this function had treated brain injured veterans of the First World War. According, accordingly, there are connections between Gelb and Goldstein's early neurological studies and work, the development of German psychiatry and psychoanalysis in the 1920s and 30s of the last century, and even links to American and British military psychiatry throughout the two <coughs> world wars, including the contributions of Fuchs and de Murray. Taking, taking this into consideration, uh, it makes it useful to review de Mare's work on larger groups through the lens of his war experiences, particularly the exhaustion centers. To explain this in a bit more detail, I will now outline some clinical aspects of larger group experience as de Mare conceptualized them. Large groups, he wrote, provoke phobic responses, and since panic is indigenous to crowd situations, it is not surprising that people sometimes take the opportunity to talk their way through panic. It has been our experience, he wrote, that panic occasioned by <coughs> public speaking, and also the traumatic neurosis can appropriately be treated in the larger group. The same, he added, can be said of problems of expatriation, of social persecution, of the survival syndrome. Building on Fairbairn's theory of object relations, namely his clinical view that the core of neurosis is the panic of separation anxiety, de Murray argued that the central anxiety in larger groups takes the form of panic, a major issue of separation anxiety, manifested in individuals as phobia, the extreme form of mental anguish, and collectively, panic gives rise to processes of massification, namely mass formation and packing, as in, wolf, as in the wolf packs, and the intense revenge motive of mob violence, as the group's equivalent of counterphobic measures. 
For the Murray, these forms of mass, mass formation represent a flight away from the attempt to develop conscious lateralized thinking in, in terms of group dialogue back into a mindless diet of leader and let as a return to binary relationships between two parties. Moreover, since the large group by its very size is frustrating, it not only occasions panic but also generates hate. Due to this, he argued that the primary problem of the large group centers around primal hate. To fully understand this, we need to comprehend, though, that for the Murray, hate provides the psychic energy for the mental processes of seeking objects. This famous claim of Fermat, libido is essentially object seeking. This search can only come into being if and when hate can be organized through dialogue. It is, due, it is only due to the st structuring of hate through dialogue that endopsychic energy may become liberated and gradually transformed into the impersonal fellowship of kinonia. In other words, the passage from hate to culture for de Mare crucially depended on the symbolization of traumatic effects, namely panic and hate. Both have to be contained in some form of symbolic currency so that they can be transformed and structured out of their biological sub subsystem and become functional for intellectual purposes. Therefore, he posited that the essential function of the larger group method and its <coughs> principal aims consist in the attempt to transform hate into dialogue and eventually to arrive at a culture of fellowship and kinonia. As such, the dialogue for the Murray can be seen as an extension and expansion of the free-floating discussion of group associations, as Fuchs had described it. An expansion, however, in which interpretations are, are arrived at in a rounded fashion through dialogue itself. However, although as a method it is no less rigorous Dialogue nonetheless differs from Fuchs's original method of access to unconscious processes in groups. In contrast to unconscious, familiocentric meaning in groups, it has to be learned like a language and functions without final truths. Although both Fuchs and de Mare advocate what Fuchs had called communication under reduced censorship, they do this in different ways, with different aims, and by employing different interventions. According to De Murray and larger groups, it is not the conductor who is the main receptacle for, proje for projections of pro parental authority figures, but the group itself, which constitutes the canvas on which the superego is projected. As a consequence of this, he emphasized that to facilitate group dialogue, the convener, in contrast to the small group conductor, gives support to the role of individuals at an ego level, encouraging freedom of dialogue and interpreting the nature of social and cultural pressures. Moreover, what the convener furthers is not insight into unconscious family dynamics, but an investigation of consciousness through outside. This clearly marks a difference from conventional small group technique. In contrast to this, group dialogue as a method indeed widens the scope of the classical formula of communication under reduced censorship. Due to this, clinical facts and phenomena become observable which are denied to the psychodynamic interpretation of psychic facts. In the words of de Mare, if the small group situation mainly evokes interpersonal experience, experiences first known within the family, the large group context contains a different range of meanings for the individual. Meanings which he emphasized are not only intrapsychic and interpersonal, but also contextual, including the impact on the individual of contextual traumas and mass impersonal forces. the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> considering the ailments to be treated in and by larger groups returns us to Northfield, reminding us 
that larger groups provide a setting in which we can explore our social myths and the social unconscious as well as a setting to address and to treat contextual traumas and tra traumatic states of all kinds. Consequently, we may assume that the salmon principles were both elevated and preserved, aufgehoben as Hegel would have it, in de Murray's notion of group dialogue. In so far it can be seen, group dialogue can be seen as an elaboration of what the salmon principles in their time anticipated and aimed for, namely the attempt to recreate what Davoine and Godelier referred to a new social link on the, on the ruins of loyalty and speech and a minimal society emerging from the wastelands of war and other social catastrophes. <laughs> Finally, I will revisit Northfield by quoting from the notes of a staff meeting led by Major Fuchs. According to Edgar Jones, Fuchs and Northfield understood a soldier's dramatic breakdown in combat in, as I quote now, a function of failed unit cohesion. Although as a Freudian psychoanalyst, Fuchs kept the distance to the concept of trauma, he did, not, he did not as a clinician. In a staff meeting in May 1945, he argued that breakdown in combat followed the fracture of links with peers so that these relationships became a source of strain rather than mutual support. The group itself was designed to restore a soldier's self-confidence um, and, and social tolerance of army life by reintroducing him to positive communal functioning. This passage clearly indicates that at Northfield, despite the existing differences, rivalries and tensions between the various subgroups on the hospital staff. There must have been a kind of agreed common clinical ground among those who participated in the Northfield experiments. This, I suppose, was the assumption that psychopathology and communal functioning are closely related, if not intertwined. Fuchs adhered to this view even in the 1960s when he emphasized that all illness is seen as interpersonal and as involving the community as a whole. Therefore, he argued that the analytic group is a token community with access to the social interpersonal unconscious. This is, uh, as many of you know, has been continued in the work of Earl Hopper, Hopper's work on the social unconscious. A fact that, that Fuchs thought was experimentally, experimentally confirmed at Northfield. As an illustration, he referred to the predicament of the hospital band, as an example of many of you might know. And regarding group analytic theory, he drew at least two important consequences from this. First, firstly, he felt compelled to extend the four group-specific group therapeutic factors he and Lewis had outlined in 1944 by the function of the group as a forum, symbolizing the community as a whole. And secondly, by his claim that psychopathology is essentially comparative, and thus a social psychopathology. Damare, as I hope to have shown, has built on this when he conceptualized group dialogue as the royal road to investigate the social unconscious or its equivalent collective consciousness, but also to treat social psychopathology. As I see it, group dialogue is, an, is thus is a necessary supplement to Fuchs's original method of free, for, of free group associations. Taking all this into consideration, for me to visit to revisit Northfield today is to reconsider and to reevaluate these propositions in the light of the current society and our present clinical and theoretical knowledge. Thank you. Just to follow on from that, um, that final um, part of your talk and now this uh, comment here,
It reminds me that while you're taught to hate the enemy and everybody else, who you fight for is the, the other members of your platoon and the love that holds and binds people together. And it's the failure of that love uh, that perhaps a place like Northfield was there to succor again. Dieter, I would, I would like to ask you if you could apply your thinking to the large group processes which we in Gassi find ourselves in from time to time. I'm thinking of the very large group in the symposium and the, I'm not sure what size it is, large group constituted by the Gassi Forum. Mm. Do you want to answer that question first, Dieter? Do you want to do? Pose your question gives me time for a little thinking. Before okay. I respond. <laughs> it's, it, it's a couple of comments about things that, that about conversations I had with Pat. Because one of the things I remember him saying about the groups of Northfield was he said these were people who had had terrible experiences and they needed time and space to talk about them. And interpretations about transfers would have been completely irrelevant and completely inappropriate. It was about giving them space to talk. The second thing that, that always stayed in my mind was when he talked about, the, I think in the later work, when he went to, to Germany with the army, he talked about people who were so frightened that they had to sleep in a locked room at night. And it was only if the door was locked that they felt safe enough to go to sleep, which is a, a, an interesting connection with what he was talking about about panic. The, the theory about hatred, as I understood it, came out of the first um, 12 to 18 months meetings of a large group in London. And he, he announced the theory in that group, it seemed to be based on his observations there. And he said the hatred arose out of the frustration of the impossibility, with the impossibility of intimacy in a large group. It was interesting because it's a, one bit of his theory I disagree with because I, I, I think one can experience it in a large group. But it was actually, it was in a sense, not to do with the war. It was to do with the idea of you can't make the kind of intimacy, intimate contacts that you can in a small group. And that's what led to the hatred of the large group and the, and the hatred that could then be used in dialogue. The, the, the final point was that discussing what emerged in median and large groups sort of, from the social unconscious. I asked him, but what if you approach a small group in a different way. If you approach a small group in the same way that you approach a medium and, medium and large group, do you think the same phenomenon come to the surface? And he said, yes, of course. I think what you say is important because the, first of all, I wanted to point out there is a clinical theory in, in Damari's work to large groups, to the understanding of large groups. And as you have pointed out, I've, and I think rightly, it was first a theory concerning panic, which was based on Fairbairn. And later on, it was a theory on hatred, but on hatred not as a psychological phenomenon per se, drive-related, but as, a, as, a, as the outcome of a frustrating outer situation. So that was, it, I would call this a kind of a structural theory of hatred. There might be best, better expressions. Now, to come back to your question, um, I find this I find this question very difficult because in Berlin, um, I was personally quite satisfied because the two effects of hate, of panic and hate, were barely visible in the large group for whatever reason. Maybe they were so strongly warded off. I can tell you in the aftermath of the Berlin Symposium, we had a very lively, if not to say complicated discussions uh, on the occasion of the meeting of the German Group Analytic Society when the, uh, the differences be between East and West Germans really exploded in the group, which were 
com almost completely absent in the large group at the symposium. And that, I feel, was a fairly common experience, that the, the Germans, so to say, did not dare to speak or to bring their difficulties in the face of an international audience which they were glad to have in Berlin. So we, behaved, we all behaved rather well. Uh, and about the forum, I, I find the whole forum not so easy and I don't feel too quali <laughs> qualified to talk about the forum, uh, but I think as far as I follow the, the, the last months, and uh, these affects have become quite strongly, especially hatred, um, which is difficult to bear. This is not an answer, not a proper answer, I suppose, but this is what, I, what comes to my mind now. But also, I wanted to underline that we have actually two methods. Fuchs had a method of understanding or have to have access to unconscious processes in groups, meaning to unconscious family dynamics. This is one method. Fuchs never ever, although he introduced the concept of the social unconscious, formulated a methodical approach to explore the social unconscious. My thesis is, and I'm in discussion with Earl about this, that group dialogue is indeed a proper mo method to do this. And I think as Fuchs and de Mare, the, the, the relation between Fuchs and de Mare with even within the Fuchsian institutes and the group analytic society is not far, it's not free from certain forms of uneasiness. We, we, we don't discuss this very much. Um, and so I felt the need to, uh, to, to, to spell this out. And the other thing is, I think De Mare, in contrast to Fuchs, had, through the exhaustion centers, had another kind of military experience, namely the experience to work with people who actually, in that moment, came from hell. They were, it, was, it took place on the battlefield. It took place on the battlefield. And that was, the North Field was sort of away from the battlefield, although I've learned from your book that in, during the Normandy days, people were flown into North Field. But the exhaustion centers were sort of working with the absolute raw affects. People, I suppose people came screaming or completely numbed. And, and, and this, I think was a unique experience which, which s sort of crystallized in De Mare's work. This is really helpful. Pardon? I said this is really helpful. Dictates for. Um, I just want to uh, thanks for your presentation and it's an opportunity to hear uh, in some ways restated some of uh, Patrick DeMare's ideas. Um, there's, uh, I have a sense of some uh, oppositional feeling and ideas to some of what you've put forward. <clears throat> it seems to me that there's a, a thesis there that coming out of Northfield and following in the practice of running large groups, that depriving individuals of what they experience or what we can view that they have as needs can produce something good. And to my mind, there's something curious about that because it can be put the other way, that when people experience strong need in the presence of others, how about attending to those needs? How about attempting to satisfy them, um, rather than 
working to you know, convert the frustration of personal, uh, the lack of intimate contact with others into dialogue. I mean, I'm trying, I'm struggling to find words for it, but there's benefit from recognising needs and actually in a therapeutic setting supplying within limits, meeting them. We've got time for one more question or comment, I think. I did have, to, I, I did have something to say, which was, which was about, I wonder what your thoughts are about um, you know, Fonagy's idea that aggression has to be unlearned, a basic principle of human development. And it seems to me that um, my thinking is about, I find it easier to understand what you've said if I substitute aggression for hatred. Because it seems to me that naturally, in a, as social beings, we, we need to aggress in the phenomenological sense of the word. And the patients that are described in your paper have completely, um, have completely destroyed their capacity for aggression, paradoxically. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does. I didn't talk about aggression. I, I, taught a, I talked about panic and hate. Yeah. And uh, this also relates to what you said, Paul. Well, um, I think <coughs> Damari, surprisingly, is quite fond of, of Lacan. <laughs> and he underlines, in his theory, he underlines the passage from need to desire via symbolization as a very basic process. We are not, not yet at the level of the satisfaction of needs. We are on the level of the recognition of needs and of a primary symbolization of raw affects. That was, that was the point. And I think at the time, I mean, we are talking about this, the Mari book is from 1991. Uh, it, it's quite some time now. So I wouldn't immediately compare it to Fonagy and others. But the Mari, the Mari introduced a point of view into, into group analysis, which has to do with symbolization. He even says, and I find this most interesting of this, he takes this from Susan Langer. He, I'll stop there, sorry. Uh, meaning, he, he introduces the category of meaning in group analysis. 